we are entering into a really exciting uh, next four or five weeks um, because we as a church, every quarter, we partner with some local nonprofits to push back against some of the darkness that we feel in our community. Uh, if you don't know much about Bridgeway, I hope that you know this, that we're not a group of people that we just want to be a holy huddle where we agree and believe the right things and gather on Sundays. No, we want to be a group of people that partner with God, that we see and hear the cries of our community. And we don't just say, oh, shucks, like, man, can't wait to get to heaven someday. But no, we, uh, we start to begin to bring heaven and that reality of God's kingdom here and now. We say that we, uh, at Bridgeway, we uh, exist to partner with God to bring the up there down here. And so every quarter, uh, we want to make an impact. Um, and we want to hear one of those cries, and we want to push against it, and we want to flood it with light. And so today, we are kicking off a new season of impact with our friends at Turning Point System of Care. Um, if you, I know everybody's had um, in your life, uh, you're at least just one or two degrees separated from someone who struggled with substance abuse disorder, someone who struggled with uh, mental health and is, is recovering or in recovery from these things. And we know this is just a reality that's happening more and more in our community. And Turning Point, man, they are doing some incredible work to push back against that. So I'd love to introduce my friend Dawn Harvey to the stage. She's a representative of Turning Point this morning. Why don't you guys give it up for Dawn? So yeah, so Don, tell us a little bit about who Turning Point is and what you guys do, sort of the scope of services. Okay, so Turning Point does a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are a not-for-profit that meets people where they are, and that is as blanket statement as I can provide. So uh, we work with people in recovery, and as Joel mentioned, that does not just mean substance use. Um, we tend, we say that everybody's in recovery from something. So you recover from a bad night's sleep, you recover from sickness, you recover from a tough workout. We, you say the word recover far more than you think you do, and then it's it's stigmatizing when you put the Y at the end. Because when you say recovery, people automatically associate that with substance use, and that's not necessarily just the truth, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all encompassing. So that's what we do. Um, we fill the gap, just like the church does where you meet people where you, where they are in their faith journey we meet people where they are in their life journey and so um, whatever that means uh, we have one-on-one -on -one peer coaches that meet people where they are like if you have a mental health recovery we've got people who have lived experience in that hmm. if you've been in cars if if you're struggling with incarceration we have peer coaches in the jail that have lived experience being incarcerated that can walk with you through that um, we've got youth peer coaches that are in the school system meeting kids as they are, um, and it's called prevention and harm reduction, where we're trying to catch the kids before they go down these paths, mm -hmm. because it's hard to be a kid in today's society with all of the things that they are facing. And so we've got three full-time peer coaches in a local middle school. So that is, that is huge. So we've got these coaches um, set across the community to try to meet people where they are. We've got therapists, we've got recovery cafes, which for youth and adults, which are even lower barrier to assist people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, you'll see on the things that you can donate, backpacks are one of them because a lot of our people just carry everything with them. And so it's, we do a lot. We have an 11 bed detox unit where we are the gap between treatment centers. Um, it's just a few things. It's just, just a, just a, a little bit. Yeah. We just do a little bit. Yeah. I love it. So what can you say about some of the impact or the outcomes just over the last couple of years that we've seen in Howard County? I know that one, one stat that you guys might be interested to hear is that, you know, over the last five years, um, you know, states, the state research shows that there were 55 suicides in Howard County over the last five years, which is terrible. It's a lot of people. But do you know that there's been over 230 overdose deaths in that same period of time? There's a lot of people struggling and you guys are pushing back against that as yeah. one of the things that you're doing as well. Yeah. Overdoses. So, um, yeah, that's huge. So we provide Narcan trainings or naloxone trainings. That's just the generic version of Narcan. Mm -hmm. So we provide those trainings for anybody who's interested in, in bringing awareness to the community like Bridgeway has a Nalox box out front. <laughs> um, we helped install the uh, the Narcan vending machine heard around the world um, that in the library here. Um, but since the installation of that vending machine, um, we have distributed 3,500 Narcan kits 
in our community. Yeah. Which is, it, all, I mean, you guys, that's like life-saving stuff. That's yeah. awesome stuff, yeah. Yeah, and that doesn't mean, like Joel and I were just talking, it doesn't mean that that's how many people have actually taken the Narcan. That's just, as, that's just community outreach. People are being prepared because if you see the scanner, if you read the scanner, it can be what it is what it is. But there, you see on there all the time, no medics available. There's, there's people, they're, they're, they need help and they can't get the help. And so it's just, I carry it in my purse. I know Molly does. Molly's here. She's our, our, <coughs> our youth, youth lead, our youth director. Yeah. And so, um, she, uh, it's, it's just good to have on hand because it's better to have it and not need it than not have it and need it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, what were you, what did you ask? Uh, yeah. Some of the outcomes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Some of the awesome stuff, yeah. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on about the things that, that we've done. Yeah, so yeah, they're making a difference, really filling the gaps so much in our community. And um, we just wanna thank you. Thanks for the hard work, the good work that you guys do. And we're honored to partner with you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. awesome. I did this last time too. I did this last time too. Um, so also, uh, I have two things, sorry. Oh um, my gosh. I know, <laughs> but it's because Sando's here. So Sando's here and Matt, he's the one that was just dunked in the tank, uh, baptized, yeah. Um, so he's, <laughs> um, <laughs> this is, I didn't do this in the first round, so sorry, you're getting this fresh. Um, he. We also reach out to community partners. So we are literally a resource hub. And so I wanted to also mention that what we do is we connect with people in the community. For our REACH program, which is our youth program, I reached out to Matt and said, hey, we have a need for these youth. Uh, they, a lot of them can't come in and meet for an hour session and just sit and stare at our faces. And so can, he, uh, he was really gracious with the why and, and connected us with a free resource to be able to come in and bring our kids so that way they have a place to go and just be, again, be with their peer coach, be, be with that person to support them, and he provided that resource for us. So that's another thing that we yeah. do is we connect to the community as well. And then my second thing is I reached out to Joel when I when I was connecting with him about this, and it's, it warms my heart that um, I know you guys partner with Valley of Grace, which is a faith-based recovery space, and that's beautiful. Turning Point is not faith-based. It's all pathways. We refer people to Valley of Grace. We refer people to wherever you need to go, and it just it means so much to me and the people that we serve that you are truly meeting them where they are in their recovery journey because faith trauma is real, church trauma is real, and this is you truly being the hands and feet of Jesus, and I just thank you so much for welcoming us into your compassion collection. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, think about it for her. Yep. You're good. Yeah, we just, where there's good work being done, it doesn't really matter. Um, so we're so grateful to partner with them. Here's how we're doing it um, over these next four weeks, though, you guys. Uh, we are doing one of our quarterly compassion collections, and all the items are going to go to the work at Turning Point. So here's the list. Uh, Prepackaged snacks, travel size hygiene items, card games, puzzle books, backpacks, bottle water, Gatorade. You can drop those off at the church anytime throughout the week. There'll be a big tote outside. You can bring them with you on Sundays. We want to bless their socks off, and we want to put fuel on their fire. And so let's be generous. Take your kids shopping with you. You can actually even Amazon things directly to the church, take a step out of it, but uh, let's just be a blessing to them with our compassion collection this month. Does that sound good? All right, one more thing, something I'm really excited about is that we're not going to just be throwing money at issues and problems, but we want to get our hands dirty. We want to skin our knees, get dirt under our fingernails in this good work as well. So we have got a list. If you scan this QR code, there are 12 different serving opportunities where we're going to Turning Point. Um, some of that's landscaping. Some of that is organizing. Some of that is um, doing things like serving meals and cooking meals there. But it's a great thing to do with your table group. It's a great thing to do with your family. It's a great thing to do by yourself and just meet some other people, but you can scan this and we're going to get uh, busy doing some great work at Turning Point this month because we're not going to just talk about it. We're going to be about it, right? And that's awesome. So yeah, so we had an awesome season of supporting Turning Point and helping uh, our community. Again, man, we are not a, a faith community here that we just stand in a room and say, yeah, I agree with that. No, we want to get in the work and uh, partner with God because he's up to something, uh, bringing his kingdom here. And so this is a part of that. So we're so grateful for Turning Point being here. They'll be out in the hallway uh, in between services if you want to connect with them, ask any more questions, but you're going to be inundated with information about this over the next couple of weeks. So it's an exciting time. Deal? Awesome. So today, as we get into the message, we are in our final week of our series on forgiveness called Hold On, Let Go. 
and I think I read somebody say this years and years ago, isn't forgiveness like a beautiful idea until you have somebody that you need to forgive? <laughs> it's just like this high and lofty, beautiful thing we tell our kids about. And then we have to actually like forgive and we're like, no, don't like that. <laughs> Doesn't feel good to me at all. I mean, and there's a part of us and just our, if we take off our church masks and everybody feeling like you've got to look and act a certain way in church, there's a part of us that when we have a grudge against somebody, when we hold resentment towards somebody, uh, it kind of feels good in the moment. It feels like we're above them in a way. And, and there's a darker part of us that we can just poke fun at a little bit, all of us, that we kind of wish that we had like a buzzer to where, like, wherever that, that person is, you know, you've got that pop-up video person already in your head, somebody that you hold a grudge against. Um, wherever that person is, like, we would love to just give them a little shot of revenge, right? Just a <laughs> little bit of a buzz where, wherever they are. It could be a small thing like, man, I hope that steak they ordered that was really expensive, I hope it comes back overcooked. <laughs> give them a little bit of that. Or, ooh, oh, yeah, they just posted a new Facebook status. Oh, oh maybe I hope, I hope maybe they're single again. They, they broke up with them. Oh, my ex is now single again. Or I hope, I hope they've got to do the extra lap around Target because there was no parking spot. Can we give them that? Can we just give them a little bit of that wherever they are? And, and we can poke fun at this a little bit, but the reality is, like, there's a part of us that we don't like saying it out loud because it sounds so gross, and it is, but we kind of want them to suffer a little bit because they put us through suffering. Can we admit that? <laughs> like we hear about their business and we see like a headline about their business and we're like, oh, maybe they're not doing well. Maybe they have to lay people off or maybe the church that they go to now is not doing well. And oh, maybe all these different kind of things pop into our head and we just want to will it into existence to will some payback to them, which in the moment feels good. But the reality is that it actually just perpetuates the hurt, doesn't it? It keeps our lives tied to that person who hurt us. It keeps the cycle of upping the ante of revenge and payback and resentment just snowballing until it's bigger and bigger. And it never just goes away. And we hold on to that resentment for dear life. And some of us, and you know people like this, if it's not you, that grudge has become their entire identity. And it's ugly. <laughs> and it's not who we want to be. But Jesus invites us into this new cycle called forgiveness of grace and mercy and accountability, yes, but letting go of those grudges. And to talk about forgiveness, we have to spend a lot of time talking about what forgiveness isn't, don't we? Because there's a lot of truisms, a lot of half-truths that people believe about forgiveness that I've really worked hard to try to dispel in this series that we've been in. So let's, let's start there with what forgiveness is not. When we're talking about forgiveness, we're not talking about these things. The first is excusing, where we kind of just make excuses for why somebody hurt us. Like having excuses, understanding excuses can help us on the journey, but just being like, well, they didn't mean to, it doesn't actually heal anything inside of us. It doesn't actually lead us to forgiveness. Forgiveness is not excusing. Forgiveness is also not whitewashing or denial. There it is. It's not denial. It's not just putting newspaper over the mess saying like, it doesn't really matter. I'm fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. You're really not fine. Denial is just saying I should just be able to forget about it. Forgive and forget, right? But you just can't seem to do that. It doesn't help you get you where you want to go and you end up holding on to it longer than you desire to. Forgiveness is also not passive revenge. I love this one because so many times, especially religious people, church people, we're like, I, I don't want, I'm not going to like take the air out of their tires, but I hope that somebody does. <laughs> it's kind of like passive of like, well, I'm not going to like do something actively, but I'm going to be like giddy when I hear about what's happening to them. And that's not forgiveness. You've not forgiven somebody if you're hanging on to passive revenge. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is also not this. It's not a probation period. It's not a, hey, I forgive you for this, but I'm going to watch you like a hawk. And if you mess up one more time, I'm telling you, you're going right away. It's all over with ultimatum. It's not probation to where you're still holding the offense on their file to where you can say, you remember that? I'm going to remember that better than anybody. <laughs> and I'm going to make sure that you remember it. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is also not this weaponizing mercy. Oh, we're good at this too, aren't we? To where we're the ones that we, we say, oh, I forgive you. 
because I'm the bigger person. Aren't you so grateful that I'm the bigger person, that I can use forgiveness? You would never use forgiveness on me. I'm going to use forgiveness on you, and you owe me. Oh, you owe me so much, and I'm going to bring this up, and you're going to like literally swoop in and give me everything that I want. Weaponizing mercy? That's not actually forgiveness either. It might even feel like a compromise in the moment, but it doesn't get the job done. Forgiveness is not abandoning justice either. I think this is important to talk about because so often when we've been hurt, uh, we want justice and we think that if we forgive, we lose and there's no justice and it just perpetuates the abuse, it perpetuates the problem. And so we're like, do I have to choose justice or forgiveness? And you no, know, we talked last week that true forgiveness is actually this beautiful space where mercy and justice meet. To where for there to be true reconciliation between two people, there needs to be an understanding of the wrong that was done and repentance or moving away from the wrong that was done, change and mercy that doesn't hold their feet to the fire forever. Forgiveness and justice actually hold hands tightly in a powerful way. And to abandon justice is actually just to do this cheap forgiveness thing that doesn't do the deep work of healing us. Forgiveness is also not this. It's not immediate trust. You ever had somebody say, like, can't we just go back to the way things were, like, right away? Like, I, I asked for your forgiveness. You said you forgive me. Like, can't you just trust me again? And the reality is that, like, something happens in hurt to where trust is lost. Trust is withdrawn from the account. And it takes a lot of time to build back trust. It's often in the forgiveness process that trust can be um, deposited back again, and maybe it never gets back to where it was, and that doesn't mean that there can't be forgiveness at play. But forgiveness is not just a full renewal of trust the way things were. Also, forgiveness is not this. It's not restoration of relationship. And there can be restoration of relationship, but forgiveness is a different idea in that process. Restoration of relationship takes two people where there was a chasm, where there was wrong between them. Restoration of relationship takes two people and actions from both. But forgiveness, as we've discussed in this series and we'll discuss today, is an act of will of just one person. It's one-sided. <laughs> so yes, there can be restoration of relationship sometimes, but you can forgive and not have even the opportunity or the option for restoration of relationship. So forgiveness is not a lot of things. What have we said that forgiveness is the last couple of weeks, especially through the lens of Jesus and he's, you know, he's our leader, our Lord. We're trying to look at the world through his eyes. The way he described forgiveness can be distilled in this definition. Christian forgiveness is this conscious decision, this act of the will to release, to let go, stop white knuckling and let go of your desire for repayment for payback, for vengeance, revenge, to let go of that, and feelings of resentment. When you think of that person and you're just like, you grit teeth and you just don't like them and you are angry at them about who they are, it's letting go of that towards someone who caused you harm. It's an act of the will, a conscious decision to release your desire for repayment and feelings of resentment towards someone who has caused you harm. And hear me, <laughs> This is not 101 human stuff. This is not natural. This is unnatural. Dare I say, like, this is like supernatural stuff that you're invited into that is so challenging. Jesus, in his teaching, multiple parables about forgiveness, he lays out four steps or four dimensions of what it means to actually live this out that we've looked at the last couple of weeks. So when we talk about Christ-centered Christian forgiveness, this is the steps of it. You know, you bring the offense to the light. I think this is so important because especially in religious circles, but I think in all circles in some ways, we just don't like to look at the ugly stuff. We don't like to think or dwell on the ugly stuff. So we just move on. We put it in a corner in a room thinking it won't ever bother us anymore until the stench reaches the room that we're actually in. Part of forgiveness has to start with staring the evil that happened to you in the eye. It, it begins with you saying, this was wrong. Something was broken in me and between us because of what you did. It's not excusing. It's not denial. It's saying that there was evil done here or wrong done here. <laughs> and I have a reason to be upset. It's not whitewashing. It's not like acting like it's not a big deal. It begins there by bringing the offense to the light. <laughs> and from there, it moves to another really heavy step. But if you want to be free and forgive, you have to have compassion for the offender, the person that hurts you. Now, hear me. This does not mean that we excuse the behavior of someone who wounded you or hurt you. 
But this does mean that you have to take pity on them, to see the person who hurts you as more than what they did to you, but as a human being made in God's image who's flawed, just like you. To uh, have compassion for the person who hurt you means that you consider life in their shoes. You consider their upbringing and the lack of tools that maybe they were handed, or you consider their fears, their vulnerabilities, why they would do what they would do. And you know what that does? It actually brings down the temperature of your anger, and it lets this desire for understanding and awe come into the room, which helps you on the journey of forgiveness. The third step is this, that someone has to absorb the debt in like an accounting kind of way. Someone has got to take the loss on their ledger. (laughs) If you've been married for like one year or no, six months or three months or like 27 hours, you know that somebody has to absorb the debt inside of that relationship. You can hold on to that thing that they said or that thing that they did or didn't do. Like it's part of your identity or you can say, okay, I'm going to tell them what happened, but I'm going to absorb that so that we can move forward. In forgiveness, the person who's been hurt always has to choose to absorb the debt instead of waiting for payback, desiring and longing and focusing on payback. You decide to take the L and you absorb the debt so that you can move forward. And then lastly, as tried as it sounds, this is the last step of Christ-centered Christian forgiveness is that you let it go. You relinquish your right to hold on to getting paid back or vengeance or for you to like look at them and see that thing that they did and you let go. You actually get to a place where you, maybe from a distance, but you will good for their life instead of evil for their life. You want blessing to come into their life, not calamity to come into their life. You see them, maybe from a distance, but you see them and you want good for them. You see them as another human traveler on the journey instead of that thing they did to you way back when. And when we walk these steps, when we move forward and understand this, man, this is where we find freedom. We release ourselves from the pain. But so much of this... Christian forgiveness thing. It's a lifestyle. It's something that we have to practice and put into place. It's so much more than just like one moment, one day, we're going to choose to be a forgiver. It's it's more than that. Uh, I think the first century Christians understood this really well. Uh, Particularly um, Christ followers in the first century in the city of Rome, the belly of the beast of the Roman empire in the first century. There was a group of Jesus followers there that had lots of different divisions among them and they were under intense pressure and persecution. For one, nobody was supposed to claim to be a Jesus follower in first century Rome because you said that Jesus was Lord and Caesar wasn't Lord. So you had to practice everything on the hush hush and you couldn't practice your faith in public. But not only that, there were relational dividing walls as well because there were Jewish followers of Jesus and then there were Gentile or other followers of Jesus and they were under one roof to be a part of this small church community and there was a lot of tension a lot of like you know I want it this way this is the way that we've always done it inside of this we know nothing about that in our modern culture right Paul writes to this group, this mishmash group of people in uh, Rome, and he's encouraging them after giving them this beautiful theology in the first 11 chapters of the book. He says, you want to know how you live out this life in light of all of God's mercy and how he, he lets everybody trust him and live in this new way? You live it out through love and through forgiveness, And with all that background, I want us to look at some of the words that Paul gives us to show us this lifestyle of forgiveness that's so challenging, but it's so beautiful and offers us a world of possibilities as well. Paul says this in chapter 12 of Romans, I believe starting in verse 14. He says this, he says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Now, there can be a lot said about the language of blessing and cursing in the first century Jewish mind. But it can't be said less that blessing is to want good, to ask God to bring good on somebody. And who is Paul saying we should bless and not curse? The people that persecute us, our enemies, the ones who put their thumb to us, that have done wrong to us, those that we would imagine we should have a a vendetta against. Paul says, no, I want you to play it differently. I want you to bless them, to pray for good to happen in their life. 
and then at the end of this passage, he continues. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited or full of yourself. I love how Paul ties this idea of pride versus humility into blessing those who persecute you. Paul's basically saying that when you bless those who have caused you harm or even worse, caused your children or other people you love harm, he says when you bless them, when you pray for good for them, you're not, you can't be prideful and do that at the same time. Pride would be like cursing them and wanting bad things to happen to them. But you, you grow into humility and you grow into a different cycle than vengeance, but of humble when you bless those who persecute you. He says, this is hard, but I'm inviting you into this other way of living. This is what following Jesus looks like. He continues the very next verse and says this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. He says, you know, the natural cycle of the world 2000 years ago and today is that somebody gives you evil, you give them evil back. And here's the secret that's not in the text is that you don't ever give them the exact level of evil that they gave you. You up the ante a little bit because you want to win, don't you? So you say another thing, you add another four letter word on top of the first four letter word to add in the tension. <laughs> Paul says, don't repay evil for evil. That's the way that the world plays. And I want to invite you to live under a different king and a different kingdom. Don't repay evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love the realism that Paul uses there when he says, you know, <clears throat> it might not be possible, but if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, do whatever it takes to let... Like if there's a chasm between you, like don't be the one holding back. Don't be the one withholding forgiveness from somebody. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be walking towards them, not walking away from them. <laughs> as far as it depends on you, be open to this person to serve them, to love them, to bless them, even if they've persecuted you. He continues and he says this. Do not take revenge. Again, that's the cycle that we're trying to break inside of forgiveness is taking revenge, wanting revenge. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Paul says here, hey, do you just think that God's not doing a good enough job? <laughs> like it's God's job to be the cosmic policeman, the arbiter of justice. He's basically telling them, he's telling us like, it's not your job. And you know what? It's not your job because you're bad at it. It's not your job because when you do it, it creates something ugly in you called self-righteousness and pride. And you become a monster in an effort to defeat the monster that hurt you. It says, trust God. God's the one who's going to be arbiter of justice. Your job is to represent him and his love and his grace. This is not for you. You're bad at it. Get a new job, Paul would say. He continues on and he says this, the very next verse. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, poison him. No, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Paul says there's something powerful that happens when you not only like bless in a way to pray for good, but when you actually actively do something to serve them, <laughs> It actually does something for you, in you. It stops the cycle and it creates something new inside of you. And then we get this like really interesting phrase in doing this, in serving them, you will heap burning coals on his head. I always used to read this like, here's the passive aggressive way to get back at people. Serve them, but burn them to death. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> give them a little bit that they're going to be like, oh no, no. It's funny because we'd want it to say that because we all want that kind of vengeance buzzer to hit them back, right? But what's interesting, when you look at the Hebrew scriptures, Paul is actually quoting Proverbs 25, exactly, word for word. And everywhere you look in the Old Testament of the Hebrew scriptures, whenever you see the phrase burning coals, it's nothing to do with punishment. It's nothing to do with wrath. You know what burning coals is in the Hebrew scriptures? It's the very presence of God. Paul is saying, when you serve your enemy, instead of retaliate, you know what you bring them? You bring them God. You bring them the presence of God, the healing power of God. You bring them God who can change their heart from the inside out. Oh, I wish this isn't what Paul said. But there's part of me that's been like, oh, how good is our God that this is what we're invited into? It's something to stop the cycle. 
Paul closes this whole passage out with these words. He says this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. He's saying, it's easy to be overcome by evil. It's easy to see evil everywhere. And I love the realism that Paul speaks here is that evil happens and evil has been done to us. And sometimes we've been the ones that have perpetuated evil as well. But, But he says like, don't play evil's game. Bring good, enter goodness, forgiveness into the equation. That's how evil is defeated. That's how evil's always defeated. Jesus didn't come to planet Earth on like a war horse with a sword, with a machine gun, with an eagle and American flag. Like as much as you you might have that t-shirt, but that's not what happened. (laughs) Jesus came to suffer, to die, to serve, to lay his rights down. And in that, the whole world was offered healing and forgiveness and a new family in eternity. Good always overcomes evil through patience, suffering, doing good instead of evil, mercy instead of retaliation or revenge. Paul's saying, I'm inviting you into the flow of what God has always been up to. It's beautiful. It's not natural, but it's beautiful. So what I want to do for the last couple minutes that we have together is I want to talk about some of the sticky situations that we might feel. The Romans had sticky situations. We might have some challenging situations with how do we forgive? What do I do to forgive? I mean, I had so many people email me, message me, text me questions over these last couple weeks. I want to speak to three or four of them um, before we get out of here today. I think there's a really valuable questions. The first question is this. How do I forgive someone who makes me mentally, emotionally, or physically unsafe? Like, are you serious, Pastor? I'm supposed to, like, forgive this person who's abused me, harmed me, makes me emotionally and not safe? Yeah, but stay with me. I, I, first, I want to say this. Um, there is something inside of me that when I, I've heard this question in a couple of different ways, four or five different times, probably, over the last couple of weeks. And I just start with this. I, I'm so sorry. Like something inside of me breaks. My blood boils a little bit. My justice meter goes to the roof. And I'm, I'm so sorry that you've experienced that. Um, the abuse that you have suffered, um, and it breaks God's heart. Because God sees you as valuable. And no one, no one, no one ever deserves to be abused mentally, emotionally, physically. No one deserves that. You don't deserve that. God sees you as valuable and his beloved. That is who you are. And so the first thing I would say to somebody who might be in a situation like this is let's not talk about forgiveness for a few moments and like let's talk about you and your safety. Maybe for you, like, you, you need to, like, just take care of yourself. Maybe it's removing yourself from a, a space or relationship. Maybe call the authorities to protect yourself, maybe other people as well. But you don't deserve that, and we need to take forgiveness off the table until you are safe and secure. That is what really needs to happen here. And, and hear, hear me. A lot, we talked a lot about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Uh, forgiving someone doesn't mean that you have to make them a part of your life in any way, shape, or form. Forgiving someone does not mean that you invite them into an intimate space of your relational circle anymore. Those, those things are not having to compute. Forgiving someone means that you can somehow, through only God's power and hard work that you have, release them from you so that you can be free from them and what they did to you. And let's go back to what the definition of Christian forgiveness is, right? Like, it's this, it's that conscious decision to release your desire for repayment or feelings of resentment. It's saying, I'm letting go of this so that I am not held in prison anymore by this. And I believe that you can do that, uh, even if someone has harmed you. And here, hear me in this. I believe that you can will good and bless the person who has harmed you in a lot of ways. But I would just bring this caveat into it. If there's been abuse or trauma inside of this relationship, I would say, uh, bless them, love them from a distance. And that's okay. It might look like severing the relationship as it is so that you can love them from a distance so that you are safe. 
but don't let anybody in the name of religion or throwing a Bible verse at you or in the name of Jesus in any way tell you that you need to stay in a situation that's making you unsafe and just forgive. That's not what we're talking about here. Take care of yourself, be free from that so that you can actually ultimately um, be free and so that you can get to a place where you can bless them and not curse them. And a lot of times what this looks like is it's working those steps of forgiveness with a spiritual leader, with a close friend, with a therapist, with a counselor who's trained in this. Um, you know, I, I wasn't you know, abused in any way, shape or form, but I, I remember uh, it was about four years ago, I, I had a situation where somebody hurt me really deeply to where I was just smoldering anger for about a week. I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating, I wasn't really even making eye contact with anyone, I wasn't talking to my wife, I was not really even spending time with my young son Jack at the time. And I found myself on a couch in a therapist's office. Here, here's the deal, I had told people to go to counseling as a pastor for like four years before I ever even did it. But I humbled myself to do it and it was like, 20 minutes in, and my therapist was like, oh, you are angry. I'm, like, I'm not angry. I'm not supposed to be angry. I'm not angry. I was so angry. <laughs> but it was through talking to him and running these steps and actually releasing this that I got to be free on the other side. You know, the danger for me in that situation, the danger for you if you've ever held on to resentment because someone's mistreated you is bitterness, the author of Hebrews says this about bitterness. I think this is so insightful. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. It describes bitterness like a root that's growing underneath the surface, but it's connecting lots of different people and communities. Bitterness is never just something that's happening to you. It's actually seeping into your relational circles. And even though they didn't cut you, you're going to bleed all over everybody else if you don't deal with it. And this language of defiling many, like we're all at danger of doing that with our family, with our relationships, with our marriages, whatever it might look like. So forgive and love them from a distance, <laughs> but forgive so you can be free. Here's another question that I got two or three times this last week. How do I forgive someone who's no longer living? If, I, if I'm supposed to confront them, if I'm supposed to actually let go of it, I didn't even get the chance to. And, and sometimes we're so frustrated because we're like, man, they controlled us when they were breathing and they're still controlling our emotions and I'm still hung up and they're not even here with us anymore. <sighs> That's so hard, isn't it? And we feel like you have that like desire for that moment where you can really tell them how you feel and how it really went down and you won't even get that anymore. And we feel kind of stuck. I know I've talked to so many people that feel stuck from this. I just did some work, and this is, these are not my original thoughts, but some, some experts in this field, um, they talk about a couple steps that we can take. I want to get really granular and practical here. If you're having a hard time forgiving someone who's no longer with us, uh, it's really helpful to write it down, to not just like think it while you're driving, but to spend time writing down like with a <gasps> pen or maybe in your smartphone, I don't know. But like write down, like claim what happened to you, bring the hurt into the light so that there can be some freedom from it. So many of us, we're so like, we're just dragging along because we never did this work and because people are not with us anymore. We feel guilty and we're just dragging along, man. God wants you to be free. So start with writing it down. Next, you got to talk it out. This can't be a one-sided thing. Maybe it's talking to them, just speaking it out. Maybe it's talking to a spiritual leader, a close friend, a therapist, but you've got to talk out, maybe read what you wrote down to get the lightness from releasing that. And then he, I think this is so thoughtful and insightful. You know, they talk about using an object to forgive those who are no longer with us, to like have a balloon that you release to represent that you have let go of this grudge or to hold on to a stone and write down the grudge and then skip it into the reservoir or whatever it might look like, or keep something on your desk to remind you that you're not held captive by what they did to you anymore. And this is a beautiful physical and spiritual act. In the Hebrew scriptures, uh, uh, the Old Testament, God's people were often commanded to create monuments to remember God's mercy, God's rescue, and what he had done. They called them masavot, masavot, which in Hebrew means, what happened here? <laughs> I love that. Because it was a monument to remind them that something beautiful happened that they could tell a story about. They could tell their kids, they could tell their grandkids, you know what happened here? God rescued us. You know what happened here? God made a way and provided for us. Using an object is a powerful spiritual and physical act to where we say in our hands, we're like, oh, I let go of this. I'm letting go of this. I am letting go. 
You don't have to be held back anymore. You can forgive even if you can't speak to them face to face and God sees your heart and he can begin that process. One last question here. How do I know that I've actually forgiven someone? How do I know I've completed the video game, beaten the big boss, and now I can move on and buy the sequel? How do I know? And I think I'd answer this question with another question. First is like, okay, I'd ask you, like, what do you think about when you think about them? And it's okay to think about the thing that happened. Like, we don't forget. That's not the way our bodies or minds are made. You know, our body keeps a score. We remember these things. But what do you think about when you think about them? Do you think about them like, oh, ax to grind against them? You think about them being punished? Or do you think about them like, oh, that was another time. I'm so grateful I'm on the other side of that. Or can you actually think about good and celebrate things that are happening with them and for them? I think that might be a sign that you're, you've actually forgiven them. But the, the other part of this is too, I don't think we should beat ourselves up because forgiveness so often is not just a, a one and done thing. It's not this cathartic, powerful moment. So often it's a process. Oftentimes I think about Jesus teaching about forgiveness when he talked about how many times you should forgive as a signpost to like, man, this is something that's a continual work to forgive. Jesus said this a couple of times in Matthew chapter 18, uh, Peter asked him how many times he should forgive his brother. Jesus says not seven times, but 77 times. In Luke 17, Jesus says, if somebody sins against you seven times in a day, you should forgive them. And this is not like in the eighth time or the 78th time, it's, it's all bets off. No, it's not that. I think Jesus is saying that this is part of the process of being a human. This is a par- part of a process of growing to look more like Jesus. So you've got to have a posture of forgiveness. It might not ever be done, but actually being on the journey of forgiveness might be the goal. So yes, it can happen in a moment, but it also is something that can happen over time as well. One last question. That's almost my call. One last question. We're not going to, here's good news and bad news. Um, how do I forgive myself? Um, good news, bad news. I got this question probably 15 times over the last two weeks. Uh, that's the good news is that we're going to talk about it, but we're not going to talk about it today. <laughs> we're at the whole, the whole sermon next week is going to talk about this. I think this is really needs a lot of that kind of treatment. So we're going to talk about this next week. How do I forgive myself? Because so many of us were being held back, not because of something that's happened to us, but because of something we've done that we can't let go ourselves. So the question I want us to land with today is not, do we have some resentments or not? Do we have some grudges? Cause I think the answer to that is probably yes, it's me. But the question is like, do you want to hold on to it or do you want to let it go? I mean, do you want to hold the buzzer of vengeance and still be tied to them in their story and think about them and have them live rent free in your head to just or do you want to like, no, I don't, I don't like what this creates. I don't like who I am with this. I want a different future. Because if you let go, you have an opportunity for a different future. Uh, I, I've been taken by the story of Corey Ten Boom, who's a woman who lived um, in the 20th century, um, 1947. She wrote an incredible work. Her and her sister were actually... Uh, prisoners in a concentration camp during World War II. She was a Dutch Christian whose family hid Jews during the Holocaust, and then she got captured. Her and her sister Betsy were thrown into Ravensbrück concentration camp, and Betsy actually died there, her younger sister. Um, And then after the war, uh, Corey went to Germany on a speaking tour, speaking about the gospel, speaking about forgiveness, speaking about what God is offering people on the other side of the war. And at the end of the meeting, while people were leaving, she saw a man walking towards her after she had given her speech. And the man, and she recognized the man. This man who walked up to her was a guard at Ravensbrook concentration camp where we were sent, she wrote. It came back with a rush, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man day after day. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. I remembered the leather crop swinging from his belt. Now he was in front of me and he lifted his hand towards her to, and thrust it out in front of her and said this, a fine message, Fraulein. <laughs> how good it is to know that as you say, all of our sins are at the bottom of the sea. 
Though he did not recognize Corey as being one of his prisoners, he was, at, he was asking a Dutch woman for confirmation that the sins of the concentration camp could be forgiven. It was the first time she had met any of her former captives. And so she said, the woman who had just given a speech about God's forgiveness kept her hand deep in her pocket as he reached out his hand for her. But she knew she had to do it. She had seen many people post-World War II who could not and who had been through their bitterness remained invalids in their lives. She also knew that forgiveness is not an emotion. It's an act of a will, a conscious decision. Silently, she prayed, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. And so she said, I forgive you, brother, I cried. With all my heart, I had never known God's love as, as intensely as I did then. The actual experience was a gift of God to me. Perhaps there would have been no other way forward for me. God will give us whatever we need as well. She says this in her book. I wish I could say that merciful and charitable thoughts just naturally flowed from then on, but they didn't. If there's one thing I've learned, she wrote at 80 years of age, it's that I can't store up good feelings and behavior, but only draw them afresh day after day from our gracious God. Forgiveness offers a future. Vengeance offers the cycle that never ends and only gets bigger and bigger. Your Heavenly Father is inviting you to forgive. Today, yes, but every day as well. Man, my prayer for you is that you will trust him that forgiveness works and it offers you a whole world of possibilities where you're not held down, but you're set free.